Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, The Steadfast Love of God. God's love is constant. It always surrounds us, not only in the good times or when we're obedient, but in the bad times, in the times that we're disobedient as well. God is a good, good God because he's a good, good father. Turn with me please to our scripture reading found in Psalms 136 verses one through three. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords for his steadfast love endures forever. For the next 23 verses, 26 in all, the psalmist says, for his steadfast love endures forever. Splashed throughout the scriptures, you will find this idea that God's love is an everlasting love, a love that knows no end. It's a boundless, borderless, bottomless, ceaseless, infinite love. Like the song, One Thing Remains by Bethel Music. It says, your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. That's God's love. God's love is an ever enduring kind of love. It weathers the time. It heals the hurt. It forgives when there should be no forgiveness and gives hope when there is absolutely no hope. David was crying out to God for mercy in Psalm 51 after Nathan the prophet told him that you're the man. And he explained to David what God had said about his sin with him sleeping with Bathsheba and having her husband Uriah killed. David, in his humble repentance, admitted that it was against God and God alone that he had sinned. He said, it is against you, O Lord, that I have sinned. And it was in God's sight that he had done that evil. And he longed for God's forgiveness and for God's cleansing. But he did not rely on his own righteousness. He didn't rely on his past relationship with God. He didn't even rely on God's promises to him. God had promised him an enduring dynasty. He said, you will never lack a man to sit upon the throne. One of your descendants will always sit upon the throne. And Jesus, a descendant of David will sit upon that eternal throne. It is a promise God meant to keep. But David didn't rely on that. He didn't rely on anything except this. He relied on the steadfast love of God, his unchanging love. Look at what he wrote in verse four of Psalm 51. Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. David understood. David knew the kind of love that God, the Lord God Almighty has. So he throws himself on the mercy, the sustaining, everlasting love, because it's a merciful, merciful kind of love. He says, for the sake of your steadfast love, not because I'm king or because I have written all of these psalms. It wasn't like, Lord, remember, it was me who wrote Psalm 23, the most recognized psalm in all of all times. That was me who wrote that. No, it was none of these reasons. The only reason that David could come up with, the only reason for him to have forgiveness was 
Forgive me and cleanse me for the sake of your steadfast love, O Lord, my God. David knew that God's love is a steadfast, unmovable love. And if he would only but throw himself on the mercy of that love, he would indeed receive forgiveness because God is love. And God's love is an overflowing love, a love that knows no limits and is not held back by any type of borders. A love that is constant, persistent, a perpetual, everlasting love. God's love surrounds us on every side. He captivates us with his immeasurable love. Paul was another one who fully understood the love of God. He wrote that his prayer for the Ephesians was that they would know through experience the width, the length, the depth, the height of God's love. I want us to read that. I want us to just meditate on that. We gotta read the NIV version. Ephesians chapter three, verse 14 through 19. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I want you to fully understand what Paul was writing here because I believe it's very, very important that you fully understand this. Paul said, for this reason, for what reason, Paul? The reason is the Ephesians were becoming a little discouraged because of Paul's suffering for the gospel. And if Paul, a mighty man of God, could go through such suffering, being constantly imprisoned, is it really worth it? So. It is for that reason, so that the Ephesians would not be discouraged about serving God because of Paul's suffering, basically, for them. He wrote, I want you to understand this. Okay, understand what? Understand the love that God has for us. Because if you can understand that love and understand the width, the height, the depth of Jesus' love that surpasses all knowledge, then you will be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. If you don't understand the love of God, then you will think that God is always out to get you. He's out there just waiting somewhere in the wings of heaven waiting for you to mess up and slap, he has you. But that is not how the love of God works. God actually looks for someone doing something that is right so that he can bless them. And those who are doing wrong, well, he looks for an intercessor who will pray and intercede for the people who are doing wrong so that he will not have to carry out his swift and terrible judgment on those people. Look at Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 29 through 31. It says, the people of the land had practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and needy and have extorted from the sojourner without justice. And I sought for a man among them 
who would build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. He looked, but he found none. Therefore, he says, I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their way upon their heads, declares the Lord God. God makes a long list of wrongs and calls out the iniquities of both the people and the priests. And they were all guilty of these things. But he doesn't want to bring swift judgment. He doesn't want to bring his terrible punishment upon them as he would be justified in doing. He doesn't do that because he does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. Neither does he find delight in punishing the guilty. God would rather bless than curse. God would rather give than take, help than hinder, forgive than punish because his love is a steadfast love. Therefore, God looked for someone, anyone, anyone at all, who would stand in the gap, who would fill the breach, who would intercede for those wayward people so that he might not have to destroy them. But the scripture said he found none. His first thought was not execution of his justice, but rather pardon. Forgiveness, that was the first thing that came into the mind of God. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus cried out from the cross, forgive them, Father. And why is that? It is because of the steadfast love of our God. I'm talking about the unbiased love of God that we've been talking about ever since we started this message. This love is so unbiased that he causes his son to rise on the wicked as well as the good. He sends his reign on the just as well as the unjust. This word translated steadfast love also means great kindness and it could also mean loyalty. In other words, God's steadfast love is grounded in great kindness and lathered with loyalty. He will never, never leave you, nor will he ever, ever forsake you. God will never leave you holding the bag, as they say, for his steadfast love is filled with mercy and it is filled with grace. Here is the good thing about it. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you came from or what you have done. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter our station in life. It doesn't matter whether we're rich or poor, white or black, red or yellow. God's steadfast love is poured out in abundance in much, much grace upon all, everybody gets a little piece of the pie. Here's what Jeremiah said in Lamentations chapter three, verse 22 and 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Therefore, once you come to a full understanding of God's love, you never mistrust God, nor will you doubt him, nor will you be skeptical of his plans for you. Then you will know the full love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, and then you will be filled with all the fullness of God. The church today is not filled with the fullness of God, which means that we do not know, nor do we fully understand the full measure 
of God's steadfast love. I saw a post the other day. Oh, I showed my wife showed me the post where a woman posted that if you're suffering from depression or from anxiety, come to Jesus and he will give you relief. The amount of hate this woman took. She was attacked from every side. People screaming, that is not how depression works. All sorts of mean things. Because she said, the love of Jesus can help you. Obviously, those people do not understand, nor do they know the steadfast love of our great and mighty God. God loves us. God cares about us. Cast your burdens upon him, for he cares for you. He loves you with an undying love. It doesn't matter. Mom and dad might not even like you, but God loves you. He died for you. That is the main reason, along with the lack of faith, why we are not seeing the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the great acts of healing that we should be seeing. Because people do not understand the love of God. Because Jesus said that all sorts of great things should accompany those who believe. Look at what he said in Mark chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. He said, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they, the sick, will recover. Do you know why we should be doing that? Do you know why? Because Jesus is the fullness of God the Father. And we, the church, is the fullness of God the Son. Look with me, please. Look at this important scripture. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in Him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Jesus houses in his own body the fullness of deity or the fullness of the Godhead, which means that all the creative power, all the goodness, all the essence of the Holy Trinity or the Godhead is all found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The whole thing, nothing, and I say nothing is missing. Now what about us, the church? For that, let us go back to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. This is the end of his prayer for those Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 9, we're going to read verse 19 through 23. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might? that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. He put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who filled all in all. So let's break this down a little bit. There is an immeasurable greatness of power that is given to us believers according to the working of the great might of God the Father. The great power is our glorious inheritance according to verse 18. How is it accessed? How do we access it? It is accessed through understanding, the comprehension of the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he was seated at the right hand of God the Father in heavenly places. He was given a seat of authority far above all rule far above all authority and far, far above any type of power, 
any kind of dominion and above every name that is named. There is no one beside Jesus. There is no one above Jesus. Everything is below and beneath the Lord Jesus, for he is all powerful, he is all knowing, and he's all loving. And he's from eternity to eternity. Then God the Father put all things under his feet, under whose feet? Jesus' feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church. Understand that with me. God the Father put everything under the feet of Jesus. So everything is a submission to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then what he did was he placed Christ Jesus as head over all things and he gave them, gave him then to the church, which is us. So therefore, we are now or his fullness, just like he's the fullness of God. Paul said that God was pleased to reveal the Lord Jesus in him. Not to him, but in him. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that we become the essence of God. We don't become junior gods. We are not and will never ever be little gods. That's not what I'm saying. We are merely given access to the power of the fullness of the Godhead because God the Father has given that to us as our inheritance. But we must be rooted, we must be grounded in love according to verse 17. So it all comes down to us understanding the steadfast love of God. As Paul stated that we Christians, the believers, are to be rooted and grounded in love that we will be given the strength to comprehend how wide, how long, how high, how deep the love of Christ Jesus is. Jesus, just before he suffered and died for us, said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. In 1997, President Bill Clinton awarded the posthumous Medal of Honor to a World War II officer killed in battle. John Robert Fox was sent to Italy to combat the Nazis. He was tasked to stay behind in a small village in Tuscany, which had been overrun with Nazis. The American soldiers had retreated and Fox hid in a house in that village. From his second floor lookout, he could see the activities of the enemy. He made radio contact with his fellow soldiers and ordered artillery fire on the same village that he was in. He figured that the artillery fire would give the U.S. forces time to retreat, then regroup, and then launch a counterattack. Fox also ordered a barrage of fire on his exact location. When the gunner received the message, he pointed out the Fox that, that's your exact location. Thinking Fox had made a mistake, he gave him the opportunity to retract. To which Fox replied, fire it. There's more of them than there are of us. His plan worked and the American forces were successful. When Fox's body was found, they saw that he was surrounded by more than 100 dead Germans. His sacrifice gave his country the opportunity to win a victory. Let me tell you, we were surrounded. We were outnumbered. And Jesus died that we might have a great, great victory. Victory over sin, victory over death, victory over the grave. He died so that we might live. And now he has been raised from the dead. Now he's seated at the right hand of power. 
and has lavished his love upon us, his beloved church. I want to know, do you love him today? Have you accepted him as Lord and as Savior? If you haven't, today could be your day. Today's your opportunity to receive that great love. All you have to do is to ask, and you will receive salvation. You will receive eternal life. And if you're ready to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me. I accept your free gift of salvation. Thank you for loving me so much that you choose to die a horrible death upon a cruel cross. I accept right now your salvation and I give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and you are saved. What I want you to do is to get a Bible. You gotta get a Bible, a physical Bible. You gotta read that Bible every single day. Highlight that Bible, get a highlighter. Highlight those verses that are meaningful, those verses that will help you during the times of, 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 of being down or times of trouble or times of temptation. Memorize those verses. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. But to help you do that, you need a church. You need a body of believers who you can love and who will love you. Find that church, a Bible-believing church who believes in holiness, who believes in righteousness. Join the church. Be discipled in that church. And you will be on the right track. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. The Lord loves you. We love you. Be blessed and stay blessed.